what is the modality? We're not coming here anymore to actually um, decide who is going to implement the projects. We talk with the government, the government tells us what is a priority, and then we come, for instance, to the um, justice sector support program that we are going to discuss today. Um, Minister Chuck tells us, I have a very good plan, a policy, could you please help? And we are sitting together, but we leave it up to the country, up to the government, to actually decide how it's going to reach the objectives. It is not longer the Euro European Union who comes here and says you have to do ABC. Of course, it's not a blank check. So um, the policy uh, is the policy of the government, but we will jointly define the objectives that we are looking for. And at the end of the day, we will, of course, only pay out um, the funds that we promise when the government has done what we jointly, jointly agreed in advance. So that's the entire idea of having a budget support modality, which we did with um, the justice sector, but also with public finance sector. And I'm extremely happy that we have reached that point because um, there are not that many countries in the world um, which you can work in this way because you need trust. You need accountability. You need to be sure that the government is going to handle it well. And um, I'm very proud to say after 46 years that we have come to that point and that that is the way that we're working with the government of Jamaica now. I'm glad that you've been able to feel that trust, but you've also emphasized to us that it depends on the programs that the Jamaican government puts forward. They're the ones that come with the ideas and you are able to support. Minister Chalk, the European Union has contributed 24 million euro to support our justice sector reform program. What does that kind of support look like and what kind of justice sector can we expect to see after the support? Well, first of all, let me thank the European Union. We have a very strong partnership which has been very beneficial to the justice sector. We have been trying as best as possible to give value for money. In particular, in terms of infrastructure, we have put in a brand rehabilitated court of appeal. The old post office at the corner of King Street and Bar Street is now a first class court of appeal which allow us to appoint six additional Court of Appeal judges so that they can function and clear up the backlog there. In addition, we have been able to put in place four family courts. We have one, two functioning at the moment, they're completed and functioning, one in Chapleton, one in Trelawney, and before September, October this year, Ambassador, we'll be opening the Manchester um, family court and also the one in St. Anne. In addition, the European Union support assists us in putting audiovisual equipment in 78 courtrooms. Some of them are, have been utilized, but hopefully before the end of the year, with improved connectivity, we will be able to do virtual court hearings in all 78 courtrooms. We are very grateful in that in addition to these infrastructure, including just parish justice centers, we have been able to reduce the backlog, especially in the parish courts. So most parish courts are now able to do over 100 percent. And what that means is for every 100 cases that come in during the course, in a period, we are, turn, we are completing, finalizing, finishing more than 100 uh, cases. The area that we are now working on very strongly is in the area of restorative justice, because with restorative justice, we are able to settle matters not only in the courts, but we are hoping to get into the communities to resolve disputes, conflicts, because these are the sort of activities that cause crime and violence, create abuses. And if we can really roll out that program even more than we are now doing, we feel that this pandemic of crime and violence, domestic and child abuse, etc., that we can reduce that. And we are hoping in time to use that restorative justice and other alternative dispute resolution to make Jamaica a place to live, work, work raise families <laughs> and do business. Ambassador Van Steen, you would have heard <laughs> Minister Chuck indicate all the innovations that the European Union support was able to do in our justice sector. How important was it for the EU to look and see that 
or justice sector needed support and then to lead to some of the innovations that Minister Chuck was able to speak about. I was quite impressed to hear that the ambition is to become the best justice system of the Caribbean and even someone said of the world. Uh, we like uh, ambitions. <laughs> so no, but honestly, I'm very much impressed because indeed it is all based on um, confidence, on trust. So you actually hand over a lot of money and of course our taxpayers as well want to see that this money is well spent. And I've only arrived here a year ago, <laughs> but I have noted and I have seen that um, this money was indeed very well spent, even in times of COVID and maybe because of times of COVID as well. I think there has been some acceleration. So I'm, I'm, I'm really very pleased that I can report to headquarters and say, well, this money um, did not disappear. It was, it was well spent. I think it's in the interest of the Jamaican citizens. Access to justice is top priority, the backlog, um, the more, let's say, um, technological um, um, infrastructure that we helped um, to build, I think all of that has been extremely useful. And let me say just one more thing before finishing. Um, since I arrived here, I don't think I have met anyone who said that this island would be a paradise if it wouldn't be for the crime. And one of the ways to help to prevent crime is justice. So that's why we think it is very, very much an essential sector for us to come in and to help. Dr. Wayne Henry, you just chimed in with the minister as he was talking about uh, Jamaica being the place to live, raise families, work, be the place that's an island paradise without crime. But we're looking at a newer Jamaica, a different Jamaica with social and technological changes. Even the way we look for justice is changing. From your perspective, why is it important to get the sort of support that we did receive from the European Union to deal with the new Jamaica? All right, thank you very much. Um, I think the justice reform agenda is, is critical to fulfilling Vision 2030, uh, Jamaica, our long-term development plan. We, we, Vision 2030 has four goals, four national goals, 15 national outcomes. Goal two of Vision 2030 speaks to Jamaica being, the society being secure, cohesive and just. And outcome six speaks of effective governance. And, and when we think of, a as we, we further development and improve the lives of Jamaicans. You're looking at justice for all. You're looking at ac accessibility, as the ambassador said, of, of justice services to all persons, uh, equity, fairness, transparency. The efficiencies that the minister spoke about are very, are very key. So the types of reforms um, included in, in the overall agenda speaks of the increased use of technology. It speaks of infrastructure building out and improving the infrastructure in the justice system. Um, improving you know, the number of judges, um, building capacity in the court system of the support staff, uh, and many aspects that it, you know, redound to a more efficient justice uh, system. And, and that then contributes to outcome five, as Ambassador spoke to, an overall more safe and secure Jamaica. So it's critical, and, and as we move forward, if you want this to be that place of choice to live and to work and to raise families to do business, you want an underpinning of of efficient justice service delivery. An underpinning of efficient justice service delivery, and that's what we're going to hear about here as we continue inside our discussion at the town hall with the European Union and the government of Jamaica's justice and public reform sector discussion, finance management programs. They're going to take a break and come back as we continue this discussion on what the contributions of the European Union have meant for the development of justice here in Jamaica. Stay with us. My name is Trisha Cameron Anglin and I am the Director of Court Administration Division in the Supreme Court. I want to use this opportunity to say a big thank you to the people of the European Union for the support and the contribution to the courts of Jamaica. The contribution is phenomenal and we are already reaping the benefits. The contribution at the Court of Appeal is phenomenal because we are now able to have the full complement of judges. Originally it was seven judges and now with the expansion and the upgrade we are able to accommodate 13 judges as per the legislation and we are able to give better service to our stakeholders.
Welcome back to our EU GOJ Town Hall discussion on justice and public finance management reforms. I'm Jody Ann Quarry. In this segment, we'll be looking at expanding justice access points for people and talk about next steps. If there are questions to the panel, we'll also take them here. Continuing this discussion about a better Jamaica, I come to you now, Leonard Burke, because the National Integrity Action is looking and seeing what these reforms have been and how they can assist Jamaica. The question of backlogs has been raised uh, several times. From your vantage point, have the backlogs been cleared and have things been put in place so that they won't recur? Okay, I think the backlog um, has not been cleared completely. And clearly the COVID pandemic has had a negative effect on it. But I think a paradigm shift has taken place. The Chief Justice in 2019 promulgated a document, a strategic plan for the Jamaican judiciary, which sets out where they want to go. And um, we know that they're also tracking the clear up rate. There are statisticians who are employed um, into, in the court services um, who, who are actually looking at the figures, and the figures we got certainly pre-COVID um, prove that, in fact, um, the numbers are going in the right direction. Um, I have no doubt that um, this will continue. I think a sea change has taken place here. A sea change, that's what you're calling it. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, you heard about the sea change. NIA is saying they are seeing clear steps that are being put in place thanks to the support of the European Union for there to be a justice sector we can be proud of. Are we looking at any time frames for us to be able to say we are done this process? Let's face it, we are really just starting in terms of getting the justice sector or the justice system to be a first-class justice system, world-class. <laughs> we believe that there can be no peace without justice. Mm -hmm. So we're taking justice to the people. And in terms of the justice centers, we have these justice centers where the persons across communities can actually go there for information and can, in fact, have a number of their problems dealt with. We want less cases going to the courts. But those that get to the courts, we want them to be resolved uh, in a timely manner. Now, that is where the backlog reduction is very important. So we want to be able to say that over the next few years, we are clearing the backlogs consistently. Yes, there will always be some backlogs over the next few years. But if we can continue to clear up the backlogs and reduce the number of cases that actually go to the courts, then I think we will be able to deliver justice in a timely manner. At the end of the day, if the justice system is what international investors look to. If a matter is to be resolved, say in the commercial courts, how quickly can it be resolved? So the Chief Justice and myself, we're trying to put timelines so that we don't think that any case sh should last from inception to the end more than, say, Five 18 years, months. Five years, seven years, year. uh, nine years. Exactly. So at the moment, we're coming from a situation where cases are now taking eight and ten years. We are hoping that, uh, hopefully by 2022, no case should be in the court longer than five years. But I hope before I leave as Justice Minister, we can get no case longer than three years in the Supreme Courts and in the parish courts no longer than 18 months. That's important because access to justice is as critical as having this court infrastructure and the like. But you have been a supervisory force, Len Ruthberg, there at the National Integrity Action. And you've also received support from the European Union. Your, the support that you receive, how does that then allow you to keep the government accountable as they are trying to meet their mandate? Okay. A lot of the work we have done has been in the area of training. So we actually go down to the grassroots, so to speak, and we have had training seminars from, which involve from the Chief Justice Court of Appeal president all the way down to the lowliest clerk in some parish court in Westmoreland. And um, we have also had training programs for justices of the peace from one end of Jamaica to the other. That's the primary work that we have done. 
that's important for us to understand. Hearing all of this, Dr. Henry, as you hear about the increased access to justice, the increased focus on mediation and alternative dispute resolution, what does that mean then for the Jamaica that we're planning to see? We have spoken about our dreams and our hopes, but does this help make it a reality? It indeed it does, Jody. And we, when you're thinking of development, you, you think of a development journey. It, development is a, is a process of improving lives and livelihoods. And, and it's important to set targets and goals and have measurable objectives that you are, you are moving towards. And, and what you've heard is, is a concrete set of, of activities in a program, well supported, well intentioned, and, and stakeholder driven that should redound to the betterment of Jamaica. I think we, we, we measure um, at the PIOJ Vision 2030 in terms of the outcomes through these what we call medium-term socio-economic policy frameworks, three-year cycles that we gauge progress and we report to the country, as you know, on a quarterly basis um, how we are doing in terms of our long-term plan and, and looking at the outcomes. And we are certainly seeing improvements in, in the justice system. We are certainly seeing the reduction in, in the backlog in the case clearance. Rates. And so we are, we are seeing a number of indicators that we are moving towards and doing well. Um, of course, as, you, as we know, in some areas we, we need to do better. As we think of crime reduction, um, we, what we are seeing as we break that out further in some areas of, of crime, um, improvements, but then in, in others, you know, we have some challenges. But it's, it's as we are moving together as a country, and I think the, the dialogue is important, the partnership is important. And when we think of Vision 2030, you're also thinking of implementing the Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. and the SDGs. And for Jamaica, there is a over 90% alignment of Vision 2030 and the SDGs, which means that if we just focus on attaining Vision 2030 goals, we would have achieved the SDGs over 90% in terms of completion. And that's tremendous. And I think that's one of the highest levels in the world in terms of alignment of a country's national plan and systems with the SDGs. So we are, we are on our way and we tend to be, be focused because, as you say, it's a journey and you want to celebrate your progress even as you, you focus on trying to focus on those areas that we may be needing to do, do better on. But we are, I think as a country, we are doing well. We are in over 67% of our overall indicators are either achieved or on the way of being achieved. And then of that 33%, then we have to continue to just redouble our efforts. But I think we, as a country, we can be encouraged and optimistic of the future. Encouraged and optimistic. Ambassador Van Steen, you've just heard the minister indicate we're not at a completion date just yet, but it's a process. Dr. Henry, it's a process. Will the EU continue to be with us through this process of reforming our justice sector? We will be with Jamaica. I'm not 100% sure whether we will be in justice, but we will continue to assist the government um, to address the most important priorities the country has. And indeed, um, citizen security is, is one of the most important priorities that we have seen, but that also the government has expressed. And I think our support to justice was one way to assist the country to address this, but we will now in the future work on helping the government to implement its citizen security plan, which um, also contributes to the same objective. Citizen security is a big talking point for many Jamaicans. The insecurity in the country affects them feeling that this is a place to live, work, raise families and do business. Minister Chuck, as we look at the justice reform program, are people starting to feel on the ground the effects and have there been places where they could go to start seeing the implementation of the work of the European Union's partnership with sure. the government of Jamaica? Well, let me say this as Minister, I am result-oriented. So I'm data-driven. Okay. So in the justice system, we have st a, statistic, a statistic department that collect data so we can see whether or not there are improvements. So even in our justice centers, we do an assessment of how many Jamaicans visit them to engage for child diversion, restorative justice, mediation, or simply seeking information. So to the extent that we have justice centers which will become the focus of peace and justice in the communities, we feel that they can contribute significantly to crime reduction, definitely to dispute and conflict resolution. Our hope is that we are going to really concentrate and 
real role in our restorative justice in many of these volatile areas. Because in these volatile communities, which is virtually all the communities in Jamaica, you have far too many people who do not know how to resolve problems, to resolve disputes. Far too many believe the way to resolve a dispute is with violence. And that is the real problems of crime and violence, murders in Jamaica. But if we can get parties to really come to the table, whether it is in a church hall or a school room or at the justice centers, to really sit with a restorative justice facilitator, to focus on the problem and resolve these disputes, then there's no doubt we can get peace emerging in as many communities as possible. When do you expect peace to start emerging, Minister? Well, uh, put it another way. I mean, I will say it publicly. Look at Grand Spen, Barbican, Shorthood. We did it. We don't have any gangs. We don't have any dons because we get people to sit down around the table. Sometimes I'm there, sometimes it's the pastors, so other stakeholders. And keep my fingers crossed, we have a, a form of volatile community that you can drive through without any problem now. Well, let's take some questions from the media because we also have media practitioners here online with us watching this presentation and seeing where they too can see how the European Union's partnership with Jamaica has helped us. So we'll be taking questions at this time. Media, don't be shy. I'm certainly certain that you have questions for Ambassador Van Steen and you have questions for the minister. We have a question here from David Solomon. Go ahead, David Solomon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Salmon from The Gleaner, and I wanted to ask the minister, given the circumstances with the COVID-19 pandemic, could he provide us with a timeline for then he believes that he will achieve his timeline of no more than three years delay for the Supreme Court and no more than 18 months for the parish court? What is very good is that the pandemic has forced us to really concentrate on virtual hearings. So to the extent that we get the connectivity, a lot of these cases will now be done, hopefully, by virtually. And it is useful to note that doing cases virtually will not only expedite the resolution of cases, but reduce the cost of these hearings. Because the accused may well be in the police station, the witness could be in the lawyer's office or at the police station, so we don't have to bring everybody into the courtroom. And that is the, the, one of the consequences of the pandemic. We are able to do it virtually with the lawyers in their office. The accused can be in the police station or at the prison. And cases are being done and they're being expedited. The Court of Appeal in particular has done all of their cases virtually so that a, an attorney in Montego Bay can present his case without having to come to Kingston. So that is a major step forward with this, that this pandemic has caused. So as we roll out the connectivity, and we're just spending some money now to connect as much as possible, so that it's very important that you are assured that the case won't break down because of <laughs> um, technology. Because if the case breaks down, you could lose the information. So once we check that out, and we're doing quite a few cases in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. we're doing a few cases in some of these courtrooms, but we want to be able to do cases in all the courtrooms. Mm -hmm. And if that is possible, Mr. Sullivan, the cases will be expedited even more expedi expeditiously than at this time. Important question, important response from Minister Delroy Chuck. We're going to take a break here in our EU GOJ town hall discussion. And we want to thank our participants, especially Minister of Justice Delroy Chuck and Mr. Lenworth Burke, the legal advisor at the National Integrity Action. Thanks so much. Stay with us. My name is Venice Blackstock Murray. I am an Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions in the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, 
We are extremely grateful to the EU for the contribution it has made to the justice system. We have benefited from the implementation of audiovisual technology within the courts, which allows us to take evidence from witnesses who will not be able to attend court personally. We know that the collaboration with the EU and the Ministry of Justice will help Jamaica to obtain a first-class justice system. My name is Emile Leibo. I'm the president of the Jamaican Bar Association. We are grateful for all the investment which has taken place in our technological infrastructure. In order to fully appreciate the benefits of the technological improvements, I think one has to have an appreciation of how things were before. So if you're an attorney at law who was situated in, for example, Montego Bay, and you had a matter in the Supreme Court, it could be a chamber's hearing, could have been for a few minutes. You would drive from Montego Bay, come to Kingston, um, sit in the judges' chambers for perhaps 15 minutes, half an hour, and then drive back to Montego Bay. So you will see there very readily that four hours of productive time easily, and that's assuming you drove enthusiastically, um, would have been lost, if not more. Um, without the benefit of the technological improvements. So we now truly have a system of justice which is accessible to practitioners throughout Jamaica as well as the individual litigants. My name is Trisha Cameron Anglin and I am the Director Court Administration Division in the Supreme Court. I want to use this opportunity to say a big thank you to the people of the European Union for their support and the contribution to the courts of Jamaica. The contribution is phenomenal and we are already reaping the benefits. The contribution at the Court of Appeal is phenomenal because we are now able to have the full complement of judges. Originally it was seven judges and now with the expansion and the upgrade we are able to accommodate 13 judges as per the legislation and we are able to give better service to our stakeholders. Oh, it's still... It
Hello everyone and welcome back to our town hall discussion on justice and public finance management reform programs, a progressive partnership between the European Union and the government of Jamaica. I am Archibald Gordon and uh, we are picking up the discussion by focusing on the PFM reform programs. We are being joined by the doctor, the Honorable uh, Nigel Clark, he is Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Ambassador uh, Van Steen, head of the European Union delegation to Jamaica, is still here with us. We're also being joined in this segment by Ms. Jeanette Calder. She is executive director of the Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal. And we still have with us Dr. Wayne Henry, who is director general of the Planning Institute of Jamaica. And I want to start with you, Ambassador. Uh, so this big goal, the U EU is investing a lot of money in it. Why is it important for the EU to help Jamaica improve public finance management? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> Let me say that when I was referring earlier to the fact that we have evolved in our way of um, cooperating with the country and that we have made that huge step towards budget support, which is actually injecting funds into the government budget, um, you can only do that if you have trust, as I said. But you can only have trust um, if you have um, accountability. I think accountability is the magic word. And um, for that, you need public finances to be well managed. So in every country where we take that step and we go towards budget support, we try to assist the government to make sure and to guarantee a well-managed um, public finance system. And that's why we have decided to do that as well in Jamaica. And uh, with uh, good successes, we're very happy. We finished our, our program uh, a couple of months ago and I asked uh, my experts um, whether Jamaica has fulfilled all the um, objectives that we had previously um, agreed on and the answer was yes, 100%, so congratulations, Minister. Thank you. On behalf of the, the staff of the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service. And, and Minister, since uh, going to you, in the Jamaican context, what do we mean specifically when we talk about um, improving public finance management? What does it mean for the man in the street? Public financial management refers to the, the system of laws, of rules, of processes uh, that a country uses to raise revenue, uh, to allocate that revenue, and to engage in public expenditure, and then to follow up with uh, reporting on that expenditure and auditing. And that entire system is what we refer to as public financial management. Why is this important to the average oh, it's, man? It's absolutely important because uh, all the services on which Jamaican citizens depend are services that have to be financed. If public financial management is not up to par, what you would find is that services will not be available. Right? Public financial management represents the resources of the state, the resources of citizens, of taxpayers being used to provide citizens with public services and public financial management is what enables that to happen and, and good public financial management is a necessary component uh, for us to achieve our aspirations as far as growth and development are concerned. And the key point that Ambassador was making there which is this point about accountability as well. Yes, I, that I mentioned reporting and audit i.e. the having the plans of government, uh, the financial plans of government, open and available for review uh, by the public, by the legislature, and also having the systems in place and the capacities in place where uh, outcomes can be uh, monitored and where uh, the systems and procedures are such that there is a record of uh, you know, expenditure and plans are done in advance and so forth. So uh, on, on that point, th this question of outcomes is key because there are a number of successes under the program. One is, as you mentioned, this question of uh, reducing the ratio of total revenue arrears to total revenue collections, and that means how much, we, how much money people owe the government vis-a-vis -vis how much money, for instance, the government collects at the same time. And the second outcome is this question that you just met, this issue that you just mentioned a second ago, which is a multi-year budget 
preparation and management system? What does that mean? Why is it important? Okay. That's, a, that's a key uh, outcome, a key success outcome. And what it means, you'd have seen it in the budget this year uh, for the first time in the budget just tabled in February um, and passed in March. And that is where we present the budget for this fiscal year. But we also include provisional projections for what next year's budget is going to be and what the following year's budget is going to be so that citizens can have a view of how the how public finances are going to evolve over time. So maybe you're going through a particularly hard year this year, but you can see how, if we're able to achieve our objective, what next year could look like and the year after. So Jamaica um, has made that advanced step of not only producing a budget for one year, but for producing at the same time three years which is a, a major, major accomplishment. I'm happy that it's been recognized. And not just important for the man in the street, but it, a, key, a, set, a key and crucial for businesses in particular, because this means that they can plan. Exactly. What it does is it facilitates, it's a, it entrenches stability by facilitating forward planning. Right? The better, we know that from our personal lives, the better you can plan in your own personal life. Uh, the more likely you are to achieve your aims. If you can have a three-year plan for your own finances, uh, you're much better off, right? So what the government is able to do is to, to share with the public three years of finances, plans for three years, so people who are going to invest, who are going to transact, uh, consumers, citizens, businesses, and households, have a certain degree of certainty about the future, which enhances... Uh, the quality of life for everyone. And that question of the, that issue of the quality of life is key here. Both you and Ambassador have raised the issue first of accountability, key, but also the question of how, the issue of how prosperity and a prosperous Jamaica not, benefits not just businesses and individuals, but also that relationship between Jamaica and the EU Ambassador. It's important for Jamaica to be prosperous. For in, the EU. Indeed. I said it's a precondition of our budget support modality, so that's very important. But in the end, of course, the most important objective of supporting a country in PFM, in public finance management, is to make sure that um, in a let's say that there is an enhancement of democratic governance and again that the citizens know, as the minister said, how their taxpayers' money is being spent. I, I think that's at the basis of every single um, democracy. So it's not just because of our um, relationship in terms of cooperation. It's something that you build in order to strengthen your democracy. Yes. If I may just, say, if I may just jump in Please. here. I mean, the EU's uh, engagement with Jamaica uh, has been quite special. Uh, the EU is the largest provider of grants to Jamaica. And as the ambassador mentioned, there engagement has been through budget support, which, re which relies on a tremendous amount of support. And the disbursements occur according to meeting the targets that the government, uh, the priorities of the government. So they're not coming to tell us what our priorities should be. They want to make sure that the priorities are aligned, but they're our priorities. And as we meet them, the disbursements happen. But yeah, I don't think there's a full appreciation of, of how the, the, the transition that we've been able to make with this kind of trust. Uh, the citizen's budget that is now a staple on the budget calendar, for example, where every citizen gets a, a simple version of the budget, that would have been a target uh, in our relationship, which we were able to achieve. Other things uh, a little earlier would have been how we, you know, there's a time when the budget would be passed in the middle of the financial year. The year would have started, we don't have any budget. Mm -hmm. April come, no budget. March, May come, no budget. Budget come in the middle of June. What happens when you pass a budget in June if the year starts in March? That's it incredible. means that all your plans are gonna be, you're gonna plan for, for 12 months, but three months is already gone. You're behind. You're gonna, you're gonna be in serious trouble. And that's what happened to Jamaica. We made the commitments, and of course, uh, these have happened on the two successive IMF programs, and those commitments allowed unlocked funds from the EU, which would have been disbursed as we met them. So out of that uh, came having a budget call in September, six months before the financial year starts, which gives MD, ministries, departments, and agencies more time to plan and more time to uh, estimate what their expenditures are going to be. And it also facilitated passing the budget before 
the new financial year begin. And we, I could go on, but I'm not going to hog the space. But just to say the modality is uh, a modality that has been quite powerful uh, because it's a modality where the priorities are Jamaica's priorities. The funding comes from the EU taxpayers, but the funding is dispersed as we meet the targets that we have set out that are with our, our priorities, obviously, that are aligned with the EU. And this also means that the government uh, infrastructure has to be much more efficient. It means a complete ch change in mindset in terms of how ministries, in terms of how agencies um, plan. No, correct. And that, and that is a challenge, right? Because what it means is that the, the level of human capital that you need in ministries to execute at this higher level of, uh, of efficiency, proficiency, accountability, um, it means that you need your, your systems of, of, of retention and reward need to be looked at. And that's something that you've heard me talk about time and time again, you know, public sector reform, where we're going to look at uh, the structure of compensation and so forth, are inextricably linked with this move that we've made over the past several years to bring the operations of government, and let me speak specifically about the operation of the Ministry of Finance, uh, you know, further, to be further consistent with international best practices. Now, we're going to be taking the break right now, but after the break, we're going to be bringing in Jeanette Calder from the Jamaica Accountability Meetup Portal, as well as Dr. Wayne Henry from the PIOJ. We're interested in finding out what is, what, what is, why JAMP is interested in this program, what does it mean um, from, from its perspective, as well as Dr. Wayne Henry, what does this mean for Vision 2030? We'll take a break right now, and we'll, we'll be, we will be right back. <laughs> I am Delroy Chuck, Minister of Justice, and with the support of the European Union, we intend to build a first-class justice system. The contribution of the European Union to the Jamaica justice system is enormous. We believe that this partnership with the European Union has been beneficial to Jamaica, and we hope that further assessment will demonstrate that the partnership between the European Union and Jamaica is one that has not only been game-changing, but will continue in the years ahead. The most significant achievement, in my opinion, was the Court of Appeal. was rebuilt. Only seven judges could have been appointed. Now we can appoint 12 judges plus the president of the court and this will ensure that at that level in the court of appeal cases will move expeditiously. It will set the tone for how we engage in backlog reduction. Welcome back to our discussion. Still with us are Dr. Nigel Clark, Ambassador Van Steen, Dr. Henry, and Ms. Calder. In this seg segment, we'll be focusing on why public finance management helps our development, and then we will look at the way forward. So let's begin with Ms. Calder. Why are the outcomes of uh, public finance management reforms important in the Jamaican context mm -hmm. from your perspective? Well, I think the minister gave me an excellent setup to answering the question. I mean, it goes really to the heart of why all of us are here. Um, if I were to ask the question, actually, how many of us depended on public services since we got up this morning? Or, even as we're sitting here, how many of us are depending on this broadcast? I mean, we'd run out of fingers, yeah? So it goes to the heart of the quality of our lives. And when the minister defined the PFM a while ago, it was really spot on. It's a full, full cycle of the budget, the planning. We depend on the technocrats, the approving. We depend on the ministers. And I used to forget until I started this program that the implementing this is the execution of the policies, the program and the projects, and then the scrutiny that comes after is the full cycle. So anything at all that the minister and the ministry and the team can do to improve that four cycles in the budget, which results in us having better services and a better quality of life, 
then in the immediate it impacts us and in the medium and in the long term. And it's not just um, the minister and the EU as donor partners, but the media is crucial, the citizen is crucial because we come in in the monitoring and the oversight. And that's the heart of accountability, as the minister says. We're the Jamaica Accountability Media Portal because um, there's been a lot of progress. And we could talk about the macroeconomic progress, but at the end of the day for the citizen, what we see with the help of the media are the headlines. And so there is still something that has to be done to plug the gaps as we talk about the leaks and tightening up efficiency. And we want to get in the ring because at the end of the day, I know the minister would agree with us that the checks and balances really rest with us as the citizens. Yeah? So we really want to be able to engage. And what the minister has done in creating that simplified citizen's budget is a game changer. I'm going to encourage him with our health minister is to not just only have the access to the information. It used to be a 10 pound book of a thousand pages that you've reduced to about 10. Book. Yes, I could build muscles with it. And I used to be so intimidated by it. Even as a senior public servant, I couldn't understand it, Minister. But in 2016, Archie, when I learned how to read four pages, then you can read a thousand, and that's the trick. And it was a game changer because I developed a sense of ownership about Jamaica. I thought I had until I could understand the budget. And I wrap up by saying, I used to think it was a book of numbers that guided the technocrats that were smarter than me, but it's not just that. It's a promise book. It's a policy book. It's a problem book. It's a priorities book. Mm -hmm. And so it became more than a national budget. It became a family budget. And I'm not just waxing poetic. When you can understand it, it, it shifts you and it changes your sense of ownership for Jamaica. So, Minister, what with the funds of the EU we want to do as JAMP is to really to begin to educate citizens. Um, I was literate, highly educated, and I was dunce about the budget. So we really want to break it down, Archie, that's the plan. If you don't understand it, then you can't hold folks to accountable. And this issue of bringing uh, uh, citizens in, yeah. into, into the discussion mm -hmm. is really key, Dr. Henry, yep. particularly when you're talking about uh, achieving Vision 2030. Yeah. And so I agree wholeheartedly, as, as Jeanette said it very well. It, development is about improving people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at PFM, public finance management efficiency, improving the efficiency, you're speaking about improving the lives of persons. How well you raise the revenues, as the minister said, and how well you expend and the areas and, and meeting the targeted areas. That it's going to the areas you intended, it's going to the right areas, and you have a way of, of showing that. Um, you know, it speaks of improving PFM efficiency, speaks of you know, accountability, increased transparency, and, and, and those underlying all of that is trust. When, when you improve PFM, you are improving trust. Someone said the speed of transactions in a society happens at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. That as we trust each other, things I get like done that. quickly. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so this is it's critical. It's, it's what we call cross-cutting. As, as Minister said, it's, it's necessary. If not sufficient, you mean other things to happen, but it is necessary. You have to have critical PFM, you know, efficiencies, and it redounds to all of us. It, it means, you know, poverty reduction. It, re it means, you know, better service delivery for social protection. In many areas, we could go on and on. And so it's very critical. We welcome the support from our, our EU partners. And as you heard, they are the largest grant donors to Jamaica, you know, tremendously positioned in terms of looking at our plans, our national goals and outcomes contained in Vision 2030, through which we are implementing the SDGs, and they are giving support on our agenda, as Minister said, and that's very important. And they are seeing some things that encourage them to want to give monies through the budget of the government because of that trust, the increased transparency, the increased accountability, the increased efficiency. So we are, we are very pleased to partner in this way for the good of Jamaica. You said that word critical several times in, in your answer, um, just reinforcing how important this is. And, and, and we're back at this question of accountability, how important it is for members, for citizens, to really understand how we spend money, um, to really understand public finance uh, in, in, a, in a wholesome way. Uh, and particularly critical in the context of COVID-19, uh, mm -hmm. Ambassador Van Steen, mm -hmm. particularly critical in the context of COVID-19 because so much has changed. And it means, as a consequence, we are going to have to be even more careful about how we spend and involve people in, in the discussions about uh, Jamaica and going forward. That is, that is correct. I mean, I think uh, but it's not just uh, an issue which is uh, relevant here in Jamaica. I think it's all over the world. I mean, uh, all the budgets are, um, I mean, stretched. And the needs um, have been increasing. 
So uh, it will be very important to see that every single Jamaican dollar or US dollar or Euro is well spent. So yeah, it's essential. And some of the next steps then. Let's talk about next steps in terms of outcomes. Minister, what are the key next steps on this uh, program? Well, we have to, uh, we're working on improving centralized treasury management, making that as robust as, as possible. Uh, we have to work on making sure that the, uh, the you know, improving the citizens' budget, as we were discuss uh, discussing a while ago. Um, out, you know, we have been working on putting in place a fiscal commission. Uh, the law has been passed. We want to uh, get that institution up and running, and that is in train in terms of uh, making sure you know, recruit the right uh, the recruitment and the offices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to, to make that a reality. Um, in addition to uh, the budget planning process, I guess I mentioned that earlier, and strengthening the um, some of the uh, reporting functions. Okay. Uh, thank, th thank you very much, Minister, on that uh, question of the next steps. Where the next steps are concerned as well, uh, we heard Ms. Calder there earlier talking about uh, educating members of the public more about um, public finances and public financing and budgeting. This is something you've reinforced. You've tried to, in many of your speeches, try to be as simple as possible, try to explain as much as possible. Is that something we're going to be seeing more of from the Minister of Finance? Yeah, that's music to my ears hearing that from Jeanette. I mean, one thing that uh, certainly has, I believe, or certainly my intent has, has marked my time as Minister has been uh, a very keen interest in public education, just in the way I have approached the job, mm -hmm. in my speeches, in my tweets, it's all about providing information and trying to explain things to people. You know, in a democracy, it's the average citizen who counts. In an autocracy, you can get by, if, right, if you want that system, with the top hundred people having all the information because they're making all the decisions. In a democracy where we have distributed decision making and a market economy where we depend on rational choices of individuals, it is critically important that the citizen understands what is happening so they can make informed choices and informed decisions. In a democracy, in Jamaica, it is the average citizen who, who counts. And so it has been my passion to raise the level of awareness an understanding of public finance in general. And I'd welcome any opportunity to partner with JAMP or with any other uh, entity or organization in improving understanding. The, the, um, understanding. And in particular, I mean, Janet made a very good point about the budget. It's a dense document, a thousand pages. And we have a citizen's budget, clearly, which breaks it down. But the original budget, I, she's right, that there is a capacity for everybody to understand that. If we engage in public education, we break it. And we are, you know, it would, first of all, what would happen is that the nonsense conversations would go away yes. and majoring yeah, yeah. in the, majoring <laughs> in the minor and, and selling, and we would have more substantive conversations. And when, when, we, have, when we can have more substantive conversations, the possibilities right, expand yeah, yeah. tremendously. Yep. I welcome the day yeah. when I can have that. Is the, that that's the level of the yeah? I mean, so coming to, I have to yeah. So I am all in support of that. I mean, I see a huge sense of, of agreement on the part <laughs> that we talked about nonsense discussions there and the importance of just educating people so that we can have substantial Absolutely. discussions. Yeah. Yeah. And you also talked about the question of engagement, and we do have at this point a member, a, a question from a member of the media. So we're going to ask David Salmon to ask his question. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, members of the panel. My question is devoted to Minister Clark. A part of public financial management is the timely development of annual reports by public sector entities. This has not been forthcoming for some bodies, and I just want to ask the minister, is the ministry looking at how to incentivize these public sector bodies to create their reports on time or to guarantee that these reports are made available when they are developed? Excellent question, David. I mean, absolutely excellent question and very topical. The first thing I want to say, just in terms of fact, is that the reports that come out on uh, public body accounts are, are not 
accurate. They're, I mean, they are behind, but they're nowhere as behind as what's in the public domain, and that is something that we need to correct. You're talking about media reports there? Yeah, not, uh, just in the public just domain. Just in the public Be, domain. Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me describe the challenge and then say what we're going to do about it. So the challenge that David uh, is referring to is a challenge where we have approximately 140 public bodies plus several other ministries, departments, and agencies. And in a, in, for good public financial management, each of those entities needs to be audited annually. In Jamaica, we are behind and have been behind for a long time, for, a dec for decades, uh, with respect to the auditing of these entities. And that's not good. It's not good because it means that the accountability is not, you know, you're accounting five years after or four years after or three years after, and it's not, just not healthy for the society. The procedure of making uh, annual reports available to the public today requires the produced annual report to go from the ministry to cabinet, go from cabinet to parliament. Mm -hmm. And you would not believe it that just that part of the process, not even talking about the audit part, there's substantial delay and reports are buried in ministries and you know that haven't gotten to parliament. If you adjust for that, right, so I mean the, the fact that a report exists somewhere, even though it may not have reached parliament, then the, the picture is much healthier than a picture that's available today. And we need to I need to bring that to the attention of the public. However, even when you adjust for that, we are behind. And we're behind for, let me introduce another uh, fact so you understand. With the constellation of entities that have to be audited, some of them are audited by the Auditor General, by law, and it tends to be public entities that depend on the, on the consolidated fund. So if, you, if you're getting an allocation from the council fund, it's more likely that the Auditor General will audit you. If you have some mix of fees and your own, you know, then you tend to be able to have an external auditor. Okay, having laid that groundwork out. For the entities audited by the Auditor General, we, are, we have a number of entities where we are way behind and capacity constraints are the issue meaning that it takes bodies and people. Yes. I have been, we have been in uh, something that I have taken on personally, I've been in dialogue with the Auditor General to develop our project where we provide the resources that we can cover that backlog. But it will take, you know, it's not a project that will take a month, it will take three years to cover the backlog on the Auditor General portion of it. And this is me um, paraphrasing information that I have received. She can speak more authoritatively on it. Which is why you sound as if you're, you're agreeing with this idea of incentivizing. Yes, um, we're going to have to projectize it. The, the backlog has been with us for some time, and the only way out of it is to projectize it. With respect to yes. the entities that are audited by uh, external agencies, um, that the only solution there is to is going to really be sustainably to, you know, continue with public sector reform and reduce the number of public bodies that we have. If you were to look at Jamaica, no excuse, but just as a fact, you know, accountants per capita, and you compare it, right? It's just that we don't, we just don't have enough accountants for us to be going around having 140 yes. public bodies, 17 ministries, and 100 departments all to be audited every year. It's not sustainable. A lot so of public sector reform there. needs to needs to be uh, addressed. But the other thing that we need to do on the other side of the equation is we need to, the, the Public Bodies Management Act has a timeline in there that is not practical for Jamaica today, which is 90 days. That's not going to happen until the level of human capital in Jamaica is such that the ratio of accountants to citizens or accountants to your population, you know, approaches more development country status. So know. a lot of challenges so lot, there, so even I, as you're working through these problems. I try to lay it out very, very, very quickly, but we yes. almost need a forum on this topic alone. It's so important, one, but, and the issues are, are not trivial. And very, um, very complex. But I hope I haven't taken up too much time to explain, to try well, to explain. We're going towards the end of the program. We're about to wrap now, so I just want to have each of you close in a minute. Key next steps, 
one thing or one thing you want members of the public to understand coming out of this project. Um, let's begin with you, Dr. Henry, and then work our way around. Oh, is that for pressure? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you can hide. So, so again, 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 PFM, public finances yeah. and management and improving efficiency of the same is critical. It will take all of us, and, and what it means is the increased accountability that as you're raising the revenue from the public in terms of taxes, these are taxpayers' money, and you are now being accountable to taxpayers for it, and then, and then how it is spent, and increasing that transparency and the management around that. It speaks about the discipline around how we engage in the discussions and the decision making. Um, and you're seeing a, a fiscal discipline framework that has been established and, and just continue to be spread, we say promulgated and put forward um, through this government, of course, uh, with a COVID pandemic and the need to pivot as priorities change because of a pandemic. You know, efficient public finances enable you to do that. You know what's coming in, you know what you need to change priorities yes. to target. And so it's, it's, it's extremely important. And, and some of our development challenges as a country, long-standing challenges, have come from relatively weak public finance frameworks that allow us to, to increase debt and our indebtedness, and that has, has caused you know, a huge burden on the country. And we've done extremely well over the last, we'll say, eight, 10 years to reduce that debt burden you know, extremely well. And a lot of that is going to be entrenched by improved public fi finance so, management. So absolutely game-changing, if I may say so. Um, and you've been saying that as well, Jeanette Calder, game-changing. But we need some more game changers. And where I think that's going to happen is that we talked about that chain. There's also something called the accountability chain in government. And no matter how we get strong legislation, and we'll be doing the a good job at that and even strengthening our institutions we've been doing a good job at that i'm really impressed whenever i read policy written by jamaicans but i am deeply concerned about one of the three functions of the parliament one of which passing laws representing the, the electorate but as it relates to the oversight function of our parliamentarians we need a, another forum but i'd yes. love to have that opportunity to dig into that because what I would like to see as a next step is when the next time we have the minister, I mean, honestly, minister, I must tell you, I really learn a lot when I listen to you and when I get your speeches and I read them, even the old ones, <laughs> really. But I'd like to see all the political representatives at budget time having 63 town hall meetings, sitting with their constituents, breaking down the budget and explaining that to them. That would be a game changer. That's a part of the educational role of the parliament and engaging citizens. But we really do want to have to talk about the gaps, the leakages, the waste, the inefficiencies, the mismanagement that exists. Because if we start to plug that, the amount of money that would be pumped back into the system for Jamaicans would be unimaginable. Oh, so that's the next step. Accountability all, all, all the way, way. around, yeah. Accountability yeah. all, all the way, way around. What would the EU, can we also depend on and expect to see the EU support continue in this area? It makes me think, but I have to say that everything I've heard here today, both on Justice and on PFM, is extremely positive and this is not just about the European taxpayer or me signing a check this is about work done here in Jamaica and I'm extremely happy because I've been in other countries and I've seen other situations so I really think um, I'm proud to see uh, what has been done here and this helps of course to engage more and to look at the future so we are now planning um, to continue to um, support Jamaica and we are in the midst of discussions to actually um, determine or listen to the government um, as to what are those priorities. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say so because um, it is not a given, like not all countries will continue to have bilateral cooperation from the European Union um, because of various reasons. But one of the reasons is that um, I think the results of what we've seen here were actually um, very good. That like so that motivates us to do more, but I'm not going to commit myself now <laughs> to uh, the amounts or to the sector, Honestly, but yeah. we're very, very motivated to continue to work with Jamaica. And in 30 seconds, running up to Prime Minister, that encouraging news there. I mean, yeah, very, very encouraging news. And thanks to the European Union again. The European Union is the largest provider of grants to Jamaica. Grants for the public is resources that come to the, to the people of Jamaica that don't have to be paid back. And so that's a big deal. Um, I think that there are a lot of areas for us to uh, improve on. One of them we just discussed a while ago, which is trying to get our uh, 
you know, audits uh, for public bodies and for departments, agencies, and ministries up to date. That would be, that's a project worth pursuing. Thank you so much, Minister. And uh, uh, thank, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Jeanette Calder from the Jamaica Accountability Beta Portal, as well as Dr. Wayne Henry, Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica. That is it for our town hall. We're exact, we're you know, completely out of time. And so at this point, we're just going to be thanking you for joining us, thanking you whether you're a member of the public, whether you're a member of the media, whether you're just watching, whether you're just completely interested in uh, not just uh, justice reform but also public finance management. And we'd like to especially thank the European Union and the government of Jamaica for making this partnership possible. Thanks also, as I said, to your guests, to my co-hosts, and to the production teams. Now, you can continue to follow the EU and the GOJ websites for updates and general information. Use the hashtag EUGOJpartnership when posting or searching. I'm Archibald Gordon. Take care. Yo, 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 this is We're committed to reducing the impact.